And so very good, thank you. And so uh, just a little bit about Dr. Tam Cummings, for those of you, this may be um, your first time sitting in on one of her sessions, but uh, Dr. Tam Cummings, she founded her company in 2009 with the mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. Now our professional gerontology practice in the Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for dementia care nationally. To date, Dr. Cummings has authored and published four books for dementia caregivers. Uh, she speaks a national podcast for dementia caregivers and has trained more than 35,000 medical professionals uh, and professional and family caregivers and community first responders nationally. Uh, she has developed the Dementia Behavioral Assessment Tool for staging dementias based upon the behaviors displayed by the person living with dementia. Uh, has developed a classification and staging tool for that behavioral communication and movement variations of frontal temporal dementias, the only tool of its kind, and was selected as a subject matter expert and program designer for in a 2018 CMP project awarded to the Texas State Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Cummings has developed okay. training. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes, we're good. Okay. okay, so I'm a gerontologist and I specialize in dementia. Thank you, WellMed. Thank you, Tina. Tina's never gotten to be my moderator before. Maybe she's just avoided me up until now. I don't know. And on my phone, it doesn't say all that stuff Tina said. It just says Tina, boss of WellMed. That's what's on my phone when, you're, when your phone rings up. Thank you to VTOS. Um, I was actually in another state and talked to some VTOS people there. God bless our hospice people. Bless you for what y'all do. You're there to help people at the end of life. And it's just so important. So thank you guys for what y'all do. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how to stage people with dementia and Minerva. If you don't have a dementia staging tool, uh, she will get those out to you in your handouts. And you can always contact me. So let me make sure everybody's got my phone number. My phone number is 254-216- 3668 and Tina will probably put that in the chat room for you so you can see it. So it's 254-216-3668. You feel free to call me if you have a question about dementia, a question about your loved one, if you need me to talk to your kids. Uh, if there's anything I can help you with, I'm glad to do that. And if you start to bother me, I'll send you a bill. Then you won't do that anymore. But do feel free to call me. I'm in central time. I do live in Texas. Uh, but I travel, so if you don't hear back from me within the first day, it doesn't mean anything except that I'm traveling. If you've not heard back from me in two days, you should call me again. It just means your message has moved down. Okay, so when we talk about staging people with dementia, Tina, <clears throat> there's two different methodologies. One is a three-stage tool that was designed for research neurologists who... Um, are just the smartest of the smartest people. It's not designed for the average person to be able to read and understand what it is that they're talking about or looking for. So in place of that, we use a seven stage tool. And that seven stage tool allows us to break the disease process down, regardless of which dementia the person has, they will nonetheless, due to brain damage, follow a somewhat predictable and progressive path. The ones that are different are the frontal temporal dementia folks. That's why they have a separate tool. And then people with vascular dementia will be a little bit different on the staging tool that we're gonna go through today. So we use a seven stage tool. And the reason for that is it allows us to break the disease process down into recognizable behaviors that a family caregiver or a professional would recognize in this person with dementia and by checking off those behaviors, it allows us to determine how advanced or progressed the disease is. And that Tina then tells us how much brain tissue is gone. That tells us what their mental equivalency is. That tells us whether or not it's time for them to be placed in skilled care or in memory care. That tells us how much time is left. It tells us what their mental age is. And so, for example, if you are a family caregiver and you go to sleep at night thinking, I swear I've been taking care of an 80-year-old, four-year-old, you've been taking care of an 80-year-old in stage six of dementia. And so all of the behaviors that you're seeing in your loved one are actually related to dementia, to the brain damage that they're suffering. And once the brain lobes become damaged, 
because each lobe of the brain does different things. Once that lobe becomes damaged, it will change behaviors. And that change in behaviors allows us to determine how advanced the disease is and all of the other things that come with that particular stage, including what its official name would be. But to start in the stages of dementia, um, we're, we're gonna start with just this slide. And this slide I think is very important because Tina, there are three stages of dementia in this slide. And this is to give families an idea of what happens in that final part of the disease. The lady in black who's in the very front is a stage five person. She has lost about half a pound of brain tissue. She has the equivalency of a 12 year old. She's very engaged with the activity director she's talking to. There's a seashell, a uh, sea star on the uh, starfish on the table. There's some uh, seaweed and netting on the table. She's locked in on the person. There's a lot of emotion on her face. She's very engaged. And you should also know as a caregiver, when you look at her hands, she also has severe arthritis and that needs to be in the care plan. So every time you're looking at your loved one, you've got to remember, is there anything I'm forgetting to tell the professional caregivers? the biggest one is gonna be that pain is not being treated. The lady in blue. Now, as you look at her, Tina, you notice there's almost a hostile but blank look to her. That's a stage six person. She's now lost about a pound of brain tissue and she has the equivalency. She's now between a four-year-old and a two-year-old in terms of, of her behaviors. And then the last lady, the lady in the middle that's leaning forward is an early stage seven person. There's, there's no emotion on the face. She's looking towards the sounds, but it's not making anything difference to her. And so things that I want you as family members to notice is notice what a decline there is between the stage five person and the stage six person, and then the further decline to the stage seven person. Now, most people with dementia will not live to stage seven of the disease. Most people will die in stage five or stage six from heart attack or stroke because that's just how humans die. And in your loved one, it is very common, Tina, that someone goes into a memory care community or into a skilled community and they look around and they say, my person doesn't look like this. And the reality is your person does. So one of the things that I want you to do today is you have two assignments. Assignment number one, well, you have three assignments. Assignment number one is to stage your person today and then put the staging tool away and don't look at it for another three months. If you read the staging tool every day, you'll think you have dementia too, okay? Number two is I want you to write a letter to yourself about what a good caregiver you have been. And, and Tina, what I'm asking people to do here is actually very hard to do but do it and then put it up. You'll be glad later on that you have that letter to look back at. And the third thing, which was um, to take your phone. And because we now carry these phones that have pictures on them, go back and get a picture for each of the last 10 years of your loved one, and then blow the picture up to where you just see their face Put those pictures one right after the other and see if you don't notice the difference that we see. And what we see is vacancy in the eye, the beginning of loss of mass in the body and in the face, and the change in how your loved one moves, talks, and reacts to what's going on around them. For some of you, you won't be able to see that difference until about five years after the death of your loved one. For others of you, you'll be able to go back and look and realize that you really have been doing care for the last 10 years at least. And I know that because otherwise you wouldn't be on this call, you wouldn't be seeking outside assistance and, and information. So the other thing is that most people in our country aren't diagnosed until stage five. So those two things tell me that we're probably all talking about at least stage five today, but let's understand what all the dementias are or all the stages are. So Tina, to start with, you and I are stage one. Everybody on the call, we're stage one because every staging tool must begin with a baseline of normal and you and I are aging normally. We know who we are, where we are and why we are. Now, most of us are gonna live and die at home. We have to remember, especially as a professional caregiver or as a family caregiver, 
Dementias are diseases of aging, but they are not normal aging. And you are going to, if you're a parent, there's a good likelihood that if you have several children, you may have a child that doesn't understand there's a disease at all. You may have a child that thinks dementia is normal aging. You may have a child that doesn't seem involved at all. Most of us are never going to require care or assistance. Most of us will live and die at home. And by that, Tina, what I really mean is we're going to live at home until we have a massive heart attack or stroke. We'll be taken to the hospital. We'll be there three days and then we'll be gone. So most of us are basically going to live and die at home. And then most of us will continue to experience full cognitive function throughout our life. We use our brain, our brain remains strong. And one of the things that we know about an aging brain is that with time, the brain becomes thicker and richer with neuron and dendrite growth. Dendrites are the roots on the neurons. And with age comes experience, files, and hopefully wisdom. We know that after the age of 50, the brain begins to work together in a dual hemispheric action that only happens after the age of 50. And so two of the books that I really encourage you to get either at your library or get them online is The Mature Mind by Dr. Cohen and The Creative Age by Dr. Cohen. When you finish reading The Mature Mind, you will feel so good about your own brain because in both of these books, Dr. Cohen explains normal brain aging, what most of us are gonna have. And when your life is, is wrapped around being a dementia caregiver, either professionally or personally, you can begin to think that this is how we're all gonna age, that this is gonna happen to you too. And that's simply not true. His other book is The Creative Age. And when you finish reading it, you're gonna feel pretty good too because in it, he talks about how our greatest works of art literature, public policy, inspiration, the people who win the Nobel Prizes, all are our older generation. And so when you finish these books, I think they're really important, Tina, because most of the time, all I read is dementia stuff. And because of what y'all do, you're surrounded by dementia things. It's important to realize we're aging normally. And so you and I are stage one of the staging tool, not because we're gonna get dementia, but because all tools must have a baseline of normal. And that's us, we're aging normally. Stage two is called mild cognitive impairment, MCI. And when you get your staging tool and you read the things on MCI on stage two, Tina, the, one of the most common things that happens with a family is they read stage two's behaviors and they go, oh, rats, I've got it too. Because stage two says things like you forget names. Now, if I was at a conference, I would ask right now how many people in here know my name and only about a third of them would raise their hand. And then I would point out that I was introduced. You're holding handouts with my name on them and my name's on the bottom of every screen. So we're worried about you. But it says you lose things. So Tina, have you lost your phone lately? Oh, I've, I've lost my glasses. Yeah, glasses, phone, the whole bit. And then you found your phone in your hand, your glasses on your head, your head. in your pocket. And that's when you knew this is more trouble than I thought it was. But <laughs> we lose phones. phones. Cell phones were supposed to make our lives easier. And that didn't happen for anybody. We actually begin to carry phones with us on vacation. And now we go on vacation and Tina, did you work on your last vacation? Did you answer an email? Did you answer me? Yeah. Did you answer a phone call? Yeah. So even yeah. vacations have been affected by cell phones. Also, if you're over the age of 60 and you dare go to the grocery store without your cell phone and your children can't find you for five minutes, they're going to call out the, the deputies to come find you because obviously something's wrong. You're not answering your phone. But it's normal to lose things occasionally to misplace your keys, to misplace your phone, to not find your glasses, because you're busy. Tina, I know you have kids. I know you have kids in band. That means Friday night football games. I, you're way up in well-med. I, I know you have things that you do all day long because you're there every day. And you're busy like other people. So one by one, as you look at the things on stage two, you could think, oh crap, I've got it too. But in reality, we all forget names. We all lose stuff. But what stage two is talking about is, Tina, do you know your daughter's middle name? Tina, do you know your mother's maiden name? Tina, do you know your PIN number for your credit card? 
those types of things are the things that a person in stage two is having difficulty with. And then, and one of the most unusual things about dementia, the stage two person will say to their spouse or their family, there's something wrong with me. And when you say, yes, I've noticed that, let's go to the doctor, they will go, yeah, we'll do that later. And so they notice it briefly and then they dismiss it. And so nothing really gets done because in stage two, it is so subtle. To diagnose a person in stage two means you got to do all of the testing to actually be able to make a diagnosis because the disease is just so early. Now, not everybody with mild cognitive impairment develops dementia, but everybody with dementia had mild cognitive impairment. And it, the reason is some people die before it becomes dementia. And we're not really sure how long mild cognitive impairment lasts. Some studies indicate it may be two to four years. Other studies indicate it may be 10 years before anybody really notices something is, is definitely wrong with this person. And part of that has to do with their education, their natural intelligence, and whether or not they're a person who thinks analytically or has been educated enough that they think analytically. When you get a master's degree, you're being taught to think analytically. And so for people who didn't naturally do that, that's where they learn it. But stage two is, in retrospect, as a family caregiver looks back, you'll look at, this, at the items that are listed, that the behaviors are listed and realize you, you did see those things. You just, you didn't know what they were. Does that make sense, Tina? It does, it does. I mean, there's just there's so much information to, to sort through and, you know. Which you know. is why you recorded this. So Absolutely. You're Absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. in stage three, Dementia is now the word that should be used, but dementia does not mean we've told you what the disease is. All dementia means is that we're talking about the umbrella term for a group of 128 terminal brain diseases. Now we really only deal with nine of those dementias because the remaining ones only happen a few times a year worldwide. They only happen if something very unusual happens. 70 are called children's. Alzheimer's because there's 70 different syndromes that are categorized as dementia in children. Huntington's even has a juvenile Huntington's uh, variation. So dementia is the word that's used, but the next question from the family needs to be, which dementia does my loved one have? Because that's gonna tell us everything you need to know. It's gonna tell you how quickly the disease will progress or how slowly it will progress. It's gonna tell you what kind of behaviors you can anticipate, whether your children and grandchildren are at risk, how much time you have left with this person, uh, what will be behaviors that we will expect to see and whether or not medications would be used. Some of the dementias are extremely sensitive to medications, whereas other forms of dementia are not. So stages two and three are considered the early stages of dementia. And this is where medication was intended to be started. Research at the National Institutes of Health indicated that if we started people with dementia on Aricept or Azadine or Exelon in these earlier stages, that roughly 70% of them would continue to age, but would not develop into stage five or six or seven of the disease, that they would die of old age causes before the disease got that pronounced. Unfortunately, in our country, most people aren't diagnosed until stage five of the disease, and by then there's massive tissue loss. So in stage three, this is typically, Tina, where the spouse has noticed that something is wrong, and the spouse lovingly and kindly says, something's wrong with your brain. Now, as you think about that, think about the second part of the equation which is something called a nosognosia. It's the inability of the brain to recognize that it's damaged. So people with dementia are not aware that they're doing anything unusual or that they're doing anything odd, that they're doing anything out of character, that they didn't finish doing something. They're not aware, the brain is not aware that it's damaged. And that can sound really weird, Tina, because my brain tells me my hip hurts from arthritis and my brain says, hey, without these glasses, you can't really put stuff in focus and see. 
So my brain recognizes those things. Ow, I hurt my finger. But the brain is not able to recognize that it's damaged. So for family caregivers, for professional caregivers, there are certain words you got to take out of your vocabulary. Your loved one is not pretending at all. That takes a three pound brain. Your loved one is not faking it. They're not showing off. They're not lying. They're not fibbing. They're not making stuff up. They are simply responding to brain damage. And if I took anyone and damaged their brain in that same manner, that person would behave just like your person. Because if you damage that area of the brain, that's the behavior you're going to get. Does that make sense, Tina? It does. It does. And it's hard to, I mean, you see the person in front of you, they may look the same, but to remember that kind of in the moment of some of these situations can be tough. But when you ask families, have you noticed a vacancy in the eyes? Every family I've ever talked to said yes, and then it's gone. And then as the disease progresses, that vacancy in the eyes lasts longer and longer and longer. And so there are things the family notices. It's just no one has told them what those things are. They see the behavior and don't realize the behavior is happening because of brain damage. And it can happen because of untreated chronic pain. That's 50% of the behaviors in a person with dementia. 20% of the behaviors in a person with dementia are that I approached too quickly. I talked too quickly. I got right up in their face. I sounded like I was angry. I didn't recognize that they can't really see me the way you and I can see. And I moved too fast. I talked too fast. I did stuff too fast. And I scared them. And if I do that, I'm going to get pushback and and I'm going to get behavior. But if I simply agree with them, if I stop trying to correct them or teach them, if your loved one asks for the salt and you know they were, they meant sugar, Tina, you just hand them the sugar. This is not a teaching moment. This is not a four-year-old growing brain. This is a brain that's dying. And so you help that brain. Stage three is very difficult to get this person to go see the doctor. And it's very difficult to get a a regular doctor to realize that there is something wrong because even though you, the family member can see it, the doctor sees your loved one for five to 10 to 15 minutes. And when you take your loved one to the doctor, I'm willing to bet Tina that you got them up, you bathed them or showered them, you got them a breakfast, you got them all dressed. And in doing those things, you got a lot of brain chemistry begin to go. Then you put them in a car and you drove them somewhere. And then they got out and they went and they sat in the doctor's office. And then they went and they sat in the little room. And then the doctor walked in wearing the same uniform a doctor has had for a hundred years. And the doctor said, hi, how are you? And because of the social conversation you and I learned when we were two, your loved one automatically said, well, I'm fine, how are you? And you wanted to kick the snot out of them because you couldn't understand how come the doctor couldn't see what you can see. And it's because the doctor isn't trained, it's because the person's not there for testing, and it's because you didn't have the tools to give the doctor that show this is what I'm seeing at home. And so using staging tools helps you to help the doctor see what's actually going on at home. Another thing is when you go to the doctor, Tina, I'm not going to sit side by side with you. I'm going to sit behind you. And every time the doctor asks you something and you do wrong, I'm going to say, uh-uh, not happening. Doesn't, uh-uh. Because if I sit right next to you and I say, yeah, she doesn't bathe. What can you do about that? Can you make her bathe? Well, Tina, now I've embarrassed you in front of a doctor and even people with dementia get embarrassed. Even brain damaged people get embarrassed. And once they get mad, they're mad until they go to sleep and can wake up again the next morning. My grandmother used to say, you can get happy in the same clothes you got unhappy in. Well, for you and me, that's true. We can get over it. But for people with brain damage, their ability to switch back to being happy from being agitated or angry usually takes sleep for the uh, brain to be able to reabsorb adrenaline. So in stage three, very subtle, you the spouse, gently pointed it out and your loved one had the reaction of human beings all over the world. They chopped your head off. Tina, right now, if I said to you, Tina, I love you. I've known you for years. You're a dear to me. I think about you. I pray for you. But I think something's wrong with your brain. 
Tina, you who I have never heard say an unkind thing would come out of your chair and come after me because it is such an insult for me to say something negative about your brain that it will make you very, very angry. And it happens with dementia people. It happens to anybody around the world. It's just a human response. So stage three is typically when the spouse said, I've noticed something's wrong with your thinking, with your cognition, with your whatever. And instead of a loving response of, oh, darling, I'm so glad you noticed that. Let us go to the doctor. You get your head chopped off. And typically spouses learn not to go back and try to agitate that person again. Stage four is the middle of dementia. This by the doctor would be called moderate dementia. And at this point, about four ounces of brain tissue, excuse me, about four ounces of brain tissue is thought to be impacted at this point. And the testing for dementia, Tina, is not done by giving someone the mini mental status exam. That's an orientation test developed in the 70s. To make a dementia diagnosis takes about 28 different tests. And Texas even developed the best practices model because we're such a rural state that it actually gives people a handout of here's the test that any doctor would be able to order and do to make a proper dementia diagnosis. And that was developed because we don't have a lot of geriatricians. We don't have a lot of, um, even though we're a large state with some huge cities, we still have massive amounts of our state that are very, very rural. Moderate dementia people get agitated with us very easily if we poke the bear. If we press this person to give us the answers to the questions, they get very, very angry. And for families, this is a hard stage for you to watch because your person is now beginning to look at you to answer the questions that the doctor asked them. And that can leave you feeling gutted because the doctor tells you not to answer the questions. In stage five, it's even worse, Tina, because now there's such a pleading look in the eyes of your loved one. Moderate dementia can make bizarre, elaborate, complex plans to do themselves in, and the plans make no logical sense. So to give you an example, the man had been in charge of psychiatric services for his entire state. He was very well known. He was a brilliant fellow. And when I saw him, I said, well, you know, how you feeling? What are you going to do? And he goes, well, when it gets bad enough, I'm going to get a round trip ticket, fly to Norway, join the Hemlock Society and kill myself. And I said, huh, why you need a round trip ticket? And he got perplexed for a minute and he said, no, no, I need a round trip ticket to fly to Norway, join the Hemlock Society, and then I'll kill myself. And I said, yeah, but you know, you don't get to come back on the top of the plane. You come back underneath the plane in the cargo area. No, no, I, I need a round trip ticket to fly to Norway to join the Hemlock Society and kill myself. Now, you know, as you think about it, that plan just doesn't make any sense. Okay. Now, that's not the same as Tina, you and I are in Texas and there's a shotgun right there and they say, I'm going to kill myself. That obviously we got to do something about right now. But the other one is just uh, not at all unusual for a family to hear, although it may frighten you. But in stage four, it's a very elaborate plan. In stage five, it's, Tina, something's wrong with my brain. I want to kill myself. And then the thought is gone. So unless there's an actual tangible physical way for them to do harm to themselves, you're simply hearing part of the disease process as, as the brain declines. Stage four people still have great social skills. And because of good social skills, they fool people. They don't fool them intentionally, like I'm trying to sneak up behind you, Tina, and grab you and scare you and fool you. They're fooling people because professionals, families, friends, people at church, synagogue, or temple believe that if your loved one was really sick, they would look sick. And the reality of dementia is you don't look physically sick until you lose a pound of brain tissue. And because the body doesn't take that hit until stage six, and in stage six, the person loses one third to one half of their body weight, because families still see this full-fleshed, full-bodied person, it can make you, the family caregiver, think that you're not really seeing what you're seeing, or that your loved one is really not as sick as you think they are, 
because they still have so much body weight and it, it doesn't matter. Dementia doesn't care. It's just that you won't see the effect on the body until an entire pound of brain tissue is gone and that's in stage six of the disease. In stage four, this is typically when the adult children begin to really realize something's wrong with my parent. And oddly enough, Tina, this usually happens at Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is the holiday where you are most likely to be around your family, not Christmas or Hanukkah, Thanksgiving. And so children come in from Thanksgiving because let's be real, I'm not using my vacation to go see my parents, but I'll come on, on Thanksgiving. So I come on Thanksgiving and I notice that mom made the pie with salt instead of sugar. The house is a little bit messy and mom always kept a very spick and span house. Mom's starting to repeat herself. She seems to ask me the same question she asked me a few minutes ago. She's telling the same story. She seems a little bit different. She seems agitated at times. And you being a good daughter, Tina, tried to point out to mom, the pie is wrong, the house doesn't look right, the mail's all piled up. I've noticed you've got scratches and dings on your cars. She's gonna take your head off because once again, human instinct to insulting my brain is to become fighting mad. And at the same time, you really are seeing brain damage but you're not gonna get a lot of support from others because if she was sick, she'd look sick. And in all other, all other illnesses, that's, that's pretty much true. If you have the flu, you look sick. If you have a cold, you look sick. If you have an upset stomach, you look sick. If you have a broken leg, we know your leg's broken. It's in a cast, you're on crutches. But in dementia, the person doesn't look ill un until stage six of the disease. So the children see something, they know something's wrong. They want to do the right thing and they may run up against the other parent who tells them it's none of their business. They may run into other siblings who don't see anything wrong at all, don't wanna see anything wrong. They may be the child that wants to, let's move forward, let's get this diagnosed, let's see what we can do. And you may find out that that gets a lot of pushback as well. So for children, I think this is especially difficult because the parents don't include you in their marriage. It's their marriage, not your marriage. And a lot of adult children get very, very frustrated because the parent who's not sick doesn't include them on what's really happening. And a lot of families will tell you they didn't realize how bad it was until the healthy parent died due to the stress of trying to care for this person with dementia. And in the three days before the funeral, they found out that their parent who survived is actually quite ill. And so that's a very common thing that happens. So stage two is mild cognitive impairment. Stage three is the beginning of dementia, typically when the spouse notices. Stage four is moderate dementia. And typically when the adult child notices something is wrong. And, and usually the adult child gets fussed at pretty severely. Stages five, six, and seven are called the late stages of the terminal stages. And they're called that because this is where death will occur. Most of the people with dementia will die in stage five or stage six from heart attack or stroke, just because that's how human beings die. Only a very small number of people will actually live to stage seven to the bed bound stage. Now, Tina, as, as people are online with us today, if your thought is, I just, wish this could be over and this could be done and they could just go to sleep tonight and not wake up. That does not make you a bad human. That just makes you human. In 34 years, I have never had a family ask me, how do I get mama to live to stage seven? Every family I've ever known thinks the very same thing. This is a devastating disease that is destroying who my loved one was. Can they please just be over tonight? And if your loved one dies tonight, Tina, you didn't make that happen. You don't have that kind of power. Stage five is called moderately severe dementia. And I've actually had people call me and tell me it's not that bad. The doctor said moderately severe dementia. Well, that means they're missing at the beginning of stage five, a half a pound of brain tissue. That's severe. And as the disease progresses, they're gonna continue to lose more brain tissue. In your staging tool, I've divided stage five into two sections because there is so much damage that occurs. Stage five is when the person begins to become incontinent of bladder. 
Stage five is when the person begins to accuse their family caregivers or other caregivers of stealing from them. And it's because I can't find my stuff, Tina, but my brain tells me my stuff's right there and I can't find it, but you're here. So you must have taken my stuff. And so a parent will accuse a child of stealing from them, a spouse of stealing from them. And it's not really stealing. It's the brain trying to logically make sense of why can't I find this stuff? I can't find it, but you're here. So you must have taken it. Now, Tina also knows that when we hear this from a person with dementia, we, we listen with one good ear because we've all run into families where someone is actually stealing from the loved one. And so we're always alert to that. But otherwise, this is a normal behavior that happens in stage five. At the beginning of stage five, your person has the equivalency of a 12-year-old. In the middle of stage five, an eight-year-old, and at the end of stage five, a four-year-old. So one of the things the staging tool does is it allows you to understand why your person's behaving that way. Frequently, families think, oh my gosh, all day long, I've been here with an 80-year-old, four-year-old. Well, what that means is you've been all day long with an 80-year-old, late stage five person, and the reason they behave like a four-year-old is due to the amount of brain damage that's occurred. They ask a lot of questions, a lot of repetitive things over and over and over again. They repeat the same story. And at the beginning of stage five, Tina, I might have to listen for 45 minutes before that story begins to repeat itself. And what you find out is that most physicians are not spending 45 minutes mm -hmm. with your loved one. So they're not going to hear that repetition early in stage five. That repetitive questions, asking you over and over again the same things or multiple things, calling you dozens of times at work, not remembering, all of those things immediately should make you realize the hippocampus no longer exists in their brain and the limbic system is heavily damaged and most of it is gone as well. As each brain cell dies, it's removed from the body and waste. So as the disease progresses, larger and larger pieces, portions, and structures and the brain are now gone. And when your loved one constantly asks the same thing over and over again, it tells you that the dementia is in the very middle part of their brain and has destroyed their hippocampus, which is what lets you make memory. They get lost outside of their normal home routine. So as the country's opened up, as people have started traveling again, they decided to go on a cruise. They got on a cruise and found out their loved one had changed. They tried to get on a plane and found out that didn't work well. They took their loved one somewhere else and realized the minute they did that, that things were not good. This morning, I was on a, a podcast with a group out of Florida, and it was where the hurricane has hit. And what they're reporting is a large number of families realizing that now that they're displaced, now that they had to leave that home and go stay with friends or family in another part of the state, that now that they remove them from where they've been, you can see their dementia much more clearly because they were so lost. People in stage five are not lazy people. Dementia people aren't lazy people, Tina. They're busy hunting and gathering. Hunting and gatherers go from room to room to room, finding neat new stuff, pick it up, bring it over here, hide it, find me some more stuff, bring it up, take it over there and hide it. That's why they tell you don't bring the good stuff to a community because the dementia people are going to find it and hide it. I have found somebody's jewelry 20 rooms down on another wing in the bottom of somebody's dresser. So don't take anything you, you can't or aren't willing to lose. Your loved one, if they're not hunting and gathering, they may be doing something called Goldilocks. Goldilocks goes from room to room to room trying out the beds, Tina, and when she finds one that's just right, she takes a nap, and then when she wakes up, she goes back to hunting and gathering, and they still don't look physically ill. If you put your person in a community and stage five is when they're qualified for memory care or for a skilled facility, they're going to put on 10 to 15 pounds quickly because communities feed them all the time. And it's okay, because in stage six, no matter what you do, they're gonna do nothing but lose weight. So if they gain a few pounds now, that's okay. You also may have a reaction if your loved one goes into a community that they suddenly seem like they've gotten better. And what you're actually witnessing is the effect of socialization. We know the more socialized a person with dementia is, somehow they do better in the disease process. Doesn't make it perfect, 
but they tend to do better during the disease. They still don't look physically ill, and because of their social skills, they still say, hi, how are you? They continue to fool professionals, family members, neighbors, family members, more family members, people at church and synagogue. And it's all because they're still able to say, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? And they respond to that because, Tina, you and I began to learn that conversation when we were two years old. Mm -hmm. And how many thousands of times have you had it over the phone or in person? What the person, um, when you have somebody who doesn't live or care for the person with dementia, but they call them on the phone, they call. And when I call you on the phone, Tina, I always say, hi, how are you? And what do you say? I'm doing fine. How are you? <laughs> and do you know why you say fine? Because your mama taught you a long time ago, I don't really care. I'm not really mm -hmm. asking because I care. I'm simply demonstrating social skills. I say, hi, Tina, how are you? You say, I'm fine, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, how's your family? Oh, they're fine, how's my family? My family's fine. How is work? Work is fine, my work is fine. How's your weather? Your weather's fine, my weather's fine. The answer to everything is fine. If you're the caregiver, you watch the person with dementia hang up the phone and you know that they don't even know they were on the phone or who they were talking to. And a few seconds later, you get a phone call from your relative saying, I don't know why you think something's wrong with mom. I just talked to her and you know what? She's just fine. And it's coming from somebody who's not in your shoes and not doing the work and the care that you're doing. By the end of stage five, this person has now lost about a, a pound of brain tissue. And they're now beginning to have trouble with language. They're now beginning to use cursing, but can still sing. And that's because this side of the brain tends to die first, leaving singing and cursing, which are over here. And as stage six begins to happen, then bowel incontinence begins to happen. In stage six, this is called severe dementia. And this person is now beginning to be hunched over when they move. They're no longer standing up straight. They're rapidly losing social skills, language, speech, the understanding of sound. But they can still curse and sing, which can make people think that they understand what they're doing and they're not. If I agitate a stage six person long enough, they're gonna curse at me because that's all they've got left to say, leave me alone. But then if I turn on church, they can turn around and sing all the verses to Amazing Grace. That's not God forsaking your loved one, that's just, brain damage and how dementias tend to progress in the brain. Their movement and coordination are affected. They're now beginning to have routine falls and everybody with dementia falls, Tina. It has nothing to do with poor care. It's brain damage. The type of dementia you have even tells us how you're going to fall. So for example, Parkinson's and Lewy body people stiffen like a plank and fall forward or backwards straight like a board hitting the front of their face or the back of their head. And it's an unusual fall, but it's unique to them. And it's related to a loss of consciousness that's not related to blood pressure. Vascular dementia and people with Alzheimer's eventually begin to fall forward out of their chairs, landing on their faces, their elbows, and their knees. People with behavioral or communication FTDs become bent by late stage five, and they're walking totally bent over with their head pointing right at the floor. They have many, many falls. So everybody with dementia falls. It's not poor care, it's, it's brain damage. Your loved one is colder than you and I are. The normal temperature in dementia at this point is now somewhere between 97 and 95 degrees. And it's important that, that the community your loved one is in takes their temperature on a monthly basis so that we know when they're having a rise in temperature. And all of this again is, is due to brain damage. Stage seven, is called very severe dementia. And Tina, this is what we think of as the bed bound stage. This person is now totally reliant upon others for care, even to be turned in the bed. They're relying upon others for care. Um, this is where the person is gonna be moved into pureed food. Their activities are gonna become tactile or aroma sensory therapies. They're going to have more and more difficulty chewing and swallowing food as the disease reaches the brainstem. Language now is mostly lost or it's only sounds or grunts or moans or gibberish. And their risk for falls and urinary tract infection continues to go up because the brain is still dying. 
And normally by the time a person reaches stage seven, if they live that long, stage seven is usually one to two years. So on each of your stages, there is a list of how long it's approximated that that stage will last. And that is one more thing to help you prepare for what comes next. So the way you're gonna use your tool today, Tina, is start in stage three and check off every behavior you see. If it's Alzheimer's, then you're just gonna go check, 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 and you're gonna check off a lot of checks and you're gonna go down the slippery slope. If your person has vascular dementia, dementia caused by stroke activity, some sort of cardiovascular events, their dementia is, is going to go down the slope differently. You're going to have a, some things in three, some things in four, some things in five, some things in six, even though the person is really not a stage six yet. And so the way you would tell that, Tina, is a stage five person still knows who their family member is early in stage five. Later on in stage five, they might begin to think that the daughter is the mother or the son is actually their husband or that their wife is their mother or their husband is actually their father. As they begin to lose memory, they're trying to put the people around them into the files that still exist in their brain. So in vascular dementia, if the person still looks alert, doesn't look sick and knows who you are, then you're probably a stage five person. And one of the unusual things about vascular dementia is in the other dementias, people become incontinent of bladder in stage five and incontinent of bowel in stage six. But in vascular dementia, you may very well see incontinence of the bowel happen first due to some sort of vascular event. So start in stage three, check, 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 check. When you finish checking, go back and look because I grade harder than you do because it's not my loved one. I'm looking at clinical features. So have a friend do it with you. Have another family member do the staging tool as well and see if you end up at close to the same place. Then draw a line and date it and come back in three months. Do not read the staging tool every day. Tina, it'll make you think you have dementia too and you don't, okay? So Minerva's gonna send out staging tools and you should be able to stage your loved one. If you get to something you don't understand or it doesn't make sense to you, just give me a call, okay? I have, I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Cummings. So uh, you, when you're finally ready to go to the doctor, like this first time that you've, you've started noticing things and you go to the doctor and you mentioned that there's a number of tests and you start you know, having those conversations with the doctor, what can a family member expect? What kind of test? Are they all just questions? Are there scans that are done? No, are it's, tests? it's 20, I believe it's 28 different tests. And on the Texas best practices model, that was all put together. Mm -hmm. And it was designed so that any family could take it to any physician and say, here are the tests to do for my loved one. Please do these tests. And several of the, of the things that are required are things that the family member can do ahead of time. Oh, before, okay. Before they take the paperwork in. So one of the things that, um, and Minerva, you should have the Texas best practices. If you don't, I'll, I'll shoot it over to you. But there's several tests that if you simply fill out these tools, your doctor's got a much better understanding of where this person actually is, no matter how good looking you made them today. Because what the doctor is looking at is what the doctor sees in front of them. And you made your loved one look like they're in stage three, and we really need them to understand they're in stage five. And so there's a number of tools to help with this. One is the Bristol ADL tool. And this is from Bristol, England, where a group of doctors decided to redo the ADL and IADL tools because those tools were not built for people with dementia. They were built for normal aging, and they were made in the 1950s. So the tool you want is the Bristol ADL tool. You want the HAM A tool, and that's all capitalized H-A-M dash A. That stands for Hamilton Anxiety Tool. And that's a tool the family fills out. You want the geriatric depression scale. And you're not going to give the test to your loved one. You're going to take the test for your loved one based on how well you know them and how they've behaved over the last week. And at the end of that test, if you've circled five bolded answers, that's a positive test for depression. You want the pain assessment and advanced dementia tool, the pain ad. 
so that you can make sure for the remainder of their life, your loved one is correctly monitored for pain. This is a generation of people that didn't complain about pain because you were taught not to, besides there wasn't anything to help you, so hush. Uh, boys especially were taught not to complain about pain. And so as a generation, they, they don't complain about pain. The other thing is the pain has come on gradually, layer after layer. Each decade of life gave you another layer of pain and you simply become accustomed to it. But the behaviors tell the person using the pain ad that this person with dementia actually has pain. So there's a number of tools that if you get them ready and get them to your doctor, your doctor is then better prepared to go ahead and order the PET scan, the SPEC scan, the EEG, the EKG, the MRI, the CAT scan, the spinal tap, and to do the appropriate blood work. And all of those things are listed in tools. It's just that if you're not a gerontologist, how are you ever gonna find them, right? No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Cheryl had a question in the chat. She said, should you take the staging results to a primary doctor or to a specialist? Uh, you'd start with your primary doctor who should then forward you on to a specialist. And the specialist is going to be a neurologist who specializes in dementia or <clears throat> if you're in one of the cities that has a, a testing center. So in San Antonio, y'all have the University of Texas and I can't remember the name of the center. Yeah. Biggs Institute. The Biggs Institute. And in UT Austin, it's the Maud Center, I think. Um, there's one in uh, Houston. I want to say Baylor Medical. Dallas has Southwest as well as Baylor as uh, testing places. Um, you have the VAs doing some testing, but they're not doing the whole, the whole battery of tests that are required. And um, for the most part, we just aren't set up to do this. We don't have a lot of geriatricians. We have very few neurologists who specialize in dementia, so it's hard. So the more information we can get to the doctor, the more likely you are to get referred over to where you should be referred to. Do you have a recommendation? Because Cheryl says she's in Philadelphia. So if they're in a different state other than Texas, um, who should Cheryl, they? Call, call um, you're in Philadelphia, call Arden Courts of, um, there's three Arden Courts in Philadelphia. Call one of them and ask, where do you go for testing? Ask the marketing person and they will know how to, how to tell you where to go. Or that sounded terrible. They'll know which doctor to refer you to. So um, anytime you can't find someone, call a memory care community and ask their marketers who are the doctors they use and they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. and, and that right there should give you an idea. These, this, these doctors must know something about dementia or they wouldn't be part of this building. Absolutely. Okay, so it's Arden, A-R-D-E-N, Courts, C-O-U-R-T-S, mm -hmm. and I was there two weeks ago, and I can't remember the names of them, uh, but there's three in the, in the Philadelphia area, just call those ladies and they'll tell you. Excellent, excellent. Does anybody else have any questions uh, for Tam or any experience, anything that you've experienced um, uh, with anything what she's talked about. Please, as, as I mentioned, you know, we want this to be an interactive session. So if you have questions, uh, you can just unmute yourself and uh, you'll have the floor. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ms. Dockett. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Cutlett, as you went through the state, just because I've been with you ever since 2018. <laughs> so, I'm familiar with these stages. Uh, you, you've done quite a, quite a great job in uh, assisting me. But uh, as you were naming and talking about those things, I wrote down the things that my husband is doing. And what we talked the last time, you told me he possibly was in stage five. Uh, he's still hunting and gathering, return and hunting and gathering. <laughs> he's changed the gate in which he walks. Uh, he's colder than normal. Uh, he fools everybody from professionals to, like you say, church people, family, and all of that. And uh, on the phone, everything is elevated. The voice is elevated. And you're correct. Everything's good. <laughs> so, well, and the uh, voice is elevated because he's not really understanding what they're saying. So he talks louder thinking he can't hear them. Like I bet if you watch, he turns the TV up real loud. 
Yes, he because does. They, they and then he'll turn it down and then bring it back up loud again. Because they think that the reason they can't understand what's being said is it's not loud enough. What they don't understand is they just can't understand what's being said. And that's why, you know, having those old TV programs is better because they're not violent. They're not cussing. They're not doing terrible things. You know, even when Matt Dillon shoots someone, I don't know if you've ever seen this on Gunsmoke, but the guy falls down, there's no blood, there's not even a hole in his shirt. He's just bang dead. And that's much different than, than the other shows. Um, you can also try music with your husband. That is a lot of times soothing to people. Um, even when they can't do other stuff, they can still dance. So um, you can try those things, but you sound like you're describing somebody who's getting very close to stage six. And I hear you. There are people that do not get support from their church, from their family, from their neighbors. And it's all people that have not spent 36 hours, 12 hours, two hours in your shoes. Thank you. Thank you. Every They're not around here. For a weekend, <laughs> they would see what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. my, my suggestion is invite them over for a party. And as soon as they show up, you disappear and go to a hotel and check in and don't tell them where you are. Stay Sound good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Let us know where you are. Tina and I'll come see you and stay with you. We'll all go out together. <laughs> I need company. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. But you, but you hang you. in there. You're doing the right thing. It's just been, we deal you, with because of you. Because of you. <laughs> that's, no, that's, I, I can't make you a good person. You were just a good person to start with. I just answered some questions. But you're doing you're doing the right thing, but you have to balance when, if he's that late in the game, he, he needs to be in a, in a nursing home and, and yes. you need to take care of yourself or you're not going to survive it. And oh, yeah. if something happens to you, which one of those helpful people is going to step up, <laughs> you know, None. and then at your funeral, they're going to say, oh my goodness, she worked herself to death. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, y'all stood around and watched. So get in a support group get in as many support groups as you need to get him into care, even if it's just respite care. The doctor will write you an order, put him in respite care means he goes there for like two weeks and you get a two week vacation. Mm -hmm. Makes and, sense. and that sometimes is all you need to get you to the next step is a two week vacation. So if that's what you need to do, you do it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You hang tough. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that is that is hard. You know, as caregivers, you get so tight into what you're doing and caring for your loved one. Often their own needs, you know, are on the back burner. And that can oh, yeah. be tough. It can be tough. Oh, yeah. For sure. if, you're, if he's in stage five, Tina, that lady's doing the work of 12 professional people. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. come in every eight hours rested. They get to go. To work. They get paid they get to go to home. Do. They get yeah. to leave. Too. They get to leave and go home where there's not a dementia person. So mm -hmm. what you're describing, ma'am, is very real. And if I could find a way to encourage you to move him into respite care tomorrow, I, I would do it just to give you a break. And if the children don't like it, tell them they're welcome to take him home. And you watch how quickly they bring him back. Does anybody else, would you like to, to share your experience or do you have a question that you'd like to bring forward? You can just unmute yourself. Usually at this point, it's just run away and hide because if I've yeah. depressed everyone here now, then my work is done. You know, it's a, it's a lot of information for sure. And just, you know, encourage you, as, as, as I said, when we started, really glad you're here because education is key. Understanding what you're dealing with is, is only gonna help you um, managing all that you're doing and knowing where to go to, to get more help. And so really do appreciate you showing up. We have these sessions recorded so you can go back and listen. Um, Tam has, a, we have a lot of sessions on our caregiver teleconnection. Minerva put the, the website up there, you know, search for her sessions. You can search for under Tam or you can search under Cummings and, and all of her sessions will come up and, uh, you know, certainly encourage you to, um, you know, listen and, and learn. And, and, and as, as she says, you know, take care of yourself uh, as well. Can I tell you one more quick thing, Tina? Absolutely, absolutely. Ms. Cheryl in, in Philadelphia and to all of you, if you will find an Arden Courts and call them, they will mail you 
uh, one of my books for free. And they keep both Untangling Alzheimer's and they keep the Itty Bitty Dementia book. So if you need a book on dementia, call in Arden Courts and ask them to mail you one and they'll gladly do it. And then yeah. you know, I can retire and hang out with my new friends, Oprah and Ellen on our <laughs> island. <laughs> Very good. Well, if there's no more questions, I just, again, thank you all for coming. I do want to mention just a couple. We have more. We have a lot of sessions uh, this month. Um, our next session is going to be on Monday at 12 o'clock Central. We're going to be talking about avoiding Medicare schemes during open fall enrollment. So it is open enrollment time. So you may be getting phone calls from insurance companies. You may see them in your local Walgreens or CVS pharmacies. Um, if you're wanting to make a change, uh, I guess my one of my recommendations is don't sign anything right then and there. Understand uh, what it is that you need and talk to a benefits counselor at an area agency on aging to get a, an unbiased view, but it is open enrollment time. And so uh, on Monday, we're going to have um, Belinda Gardner talk about how to avoid some of those insurance schemes, especially with Medicare. Um, we're going to talk about brain health with Dr. Predario. He'll be with us on, on the 11th. And then we'll have a Dear Lucy on October next Thursday uh, at 10 a.m. Central on how to handle hygiene issues um, for persons living with dementia. And we have a number of others for the rest of the month. I also want to mention quickly, we do have two caregiver summits coming up in November. And the focus of these, the theme of these summits are uh, caregiver wellness, mind, body, and spirit. So how you can take those steps to, uh, you know, take take time for yourself and refill your cup and replenish your cup. And so that you can keep on doing what you're doing and keep yourself healthy uh, as well. So our first summit is going to be on November 10th. Uh, this one will be in English. We have Dr. Chisholm, Margaret Chisholm. Um, she is going to be coming to speaking about uh, from survive to thrive, uh, living your best life. And then Dr. Jamie Heisman, who is a, a, a frequent guest on the teleconnections uh, program, He'll be talking uh, to caregivers as well on that session. It's virtual, it's actually hybrid. We're gonna have some in-person locations around Texas, but most of the, the speakers will be online. Also on the 17th, we'll have a similar summit um, from 10 to, to one, both are from 10 to one central time, but this one will be in Spanish uh, on the 17th. Um, again, just the focus on how caregivers can best care for themselves. Um, oh, uh, let me see. Uh, Louise mentioned, she just, Louise DeBoff made a comment. I have a comment. How do you convince someone, particularly husband, that they have to go to a nursing home? That's a tough um, question. You don't, you don't have that conversation with them. Um, you, you can't talk to a brain damaged person about their care needs um, any more than we would ask a five-year-old, would you like to go to school for the next 12 years? We don't ask children that, and our loved ones with dementia can't be part of the caregiving conversation. So what you're going to do is you get an order from the doctor, uh, you go to your nursing home or skilled facility, that whichever one you've picked out, they're the same thing. Um, you talk to the admissions director, they'll get everything ready, they'll get the order written from the doctor, and then you're going to bring your loved one over there to have lunch. You're going to have their room ready for them. That means their pillow, their kind and color of sheets, their thickness and kind of comforter, um, their chair, a piece of their art, uh, pictures of family. But pictures of family, Tina, may not be you and me today. It may be great grandma and great grandpa. Um, and then uh, their favorite cologne or perfume. And those things are actually what make home home. Or, or having our, our pillow, our sheets, our bed covers, having our bed something comfy is it makes us feel like home, the piece of art, the chair, the family photos, and then that cologne. All of those are the things that tell us it's home. And um, you bring them there for lunch and then they will come and engage your person and you leave. And they're gonna ask you not to come back for several days. And the reason for that is not that they're up to something evil. The reason for that is that at that point, you are usually very, just your medical health is precarious and they want you to go home and sleep. And that's why they tell you not to come back for several days is so that you can go home and get some rest. The first night is very difficult. When you go back through the door and you realize your loved one won't be coming back, it's very much like the feeling at a funeral. 
And it, you're already, everybody on this call is grieving at post-death grief already for your loved one because the person you knew, less and less of that person is there. And, and so you're grieving, rightfully so, for that loss. So it, it is a powerful day. And you wanna make sure on that day, after all you've done, that you come home to a nice dinner and a bubble bath or something that you find enjoyable, okay? And, and expect to cry. We cry, grief tears are different than I stub my toe tears, Tina. Grief tears help carry the, the toxins out of my brain that are produced as I grieve. So they don't get to talk about it. It's, it's just, we, we can't let brain damaged people be part of the care conversation. Mm -hmm. And the state trusts that you as their loved one are making the best decision possible on, on their behalf and the doctor writes the order and then the move is made. Wonderful words, wonderful words for sure. Anybody else before we sign off for today? No, because we're all crying now. So I know. <laughs> yeah. it's tough, but know that you're not alone and know that there are resources out there. You know, Dr. Tam gave her phone number uh, here at the Caregiver SOS program. You can always give us a call at 1-866-390-6491. Uh, we have caregiver specialists that can that can listen. You know, if you just need somebody to listen to, uh, you you know, please don't hesitate to call Area Agencies on Aging. Uh, there there are resources out there to help you. So just know that you don't have to to walk this journey by yourself. So, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Yay, everybody. Y'all hang in there. You're all doing a great job and God bless you. Everybody stay safe. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.